Hello, Faith hey, family. <laughs> Boy, you sent all of us tonight. We have a couple of announcements before we get started and let Pastor go with the Bible study. I'm looking forward to the Bible study of the Word tonight. But I've got an exciting announcement for our ladies. Ladies, listen up. We're going to be spreading the word, I hope, um, to the others who, who uh, log on later or maybe miss uh, and catch up later on. Help me spread the word. But what we have planned, we got some plans for us girls. We're going to have a craft today for just our ladies. We're mm -hmm. going to make two crafts for Christmas. Um, and it's going to be on November the 14th, which is a Saturday. It's going to be at 2 o'clock at the church. Um, all you need to do, I'm going to have a sign-up sheet this Sunday on the um, visitor center. And so you can sign up if you're interested. It will cost $10 um, because we have to get all the materials and things for the crafts. But it's going to be a great time of being together. Um, I'm going to have just a small devotion with you during that time. And, and we're just mainly going to get together in fellowship because it's been a while. Uh, we can't really have a lot of food and things like that right now with everything going on. We're being careful. So this is a good alternative, and I think that we really would enjoy that. So mark your calendar for November the 14th. The sign-up sheet will be out this Sunday. I'm going to start putting things also on social media, Facebook, and different things you can share uh, in the next day or so. So be looking for that. And we're going to um, ask that you sign up by the 4th, um, which seems probably a little early, but uh, Sister Sue Teasley and I are sort of working on this together, and we have to uh, get some things together material-wise as people pay. You know, we have to go out and buy the materials. So by the 4th, if you're interested, let us know by November 4th. Um, either text, email, you know, Facebook message us, or just sign up on the uh, registry uh, of the sign-up sheet uh, out in the um, community community center area of our church on the on the on the desk there. Um, this Sunday starting, so I'm so excited that we have something to look forward to, girls, and and um, I know God's going to bless our time of fellowship. And um, I hope you're excited as I am. Now, Brother Andrew has a message he wants. Real quick before I do my announcement, I saw where Sister Sue said that she's having a hard time hearing. Sister Sue, if you are still having a hard time hearing, try backing out of the video and coming back in. Sometimes that will fix your audio problem. If it persists, let us know. All right, for my announcement, remember that this Friday is... Uh, sorry, Dad. <laughs> I'm naturally loud. Uh, I get it from a good man. Uh, but... This Friday at 5.30, we are meeting at the church to package bags of candy. We've still got tons and tons of bags of candy. I know some people have been working on it, but and thank you for those who've been working on it. But uh, we still got plenty of bags of candy left to bag up because um, we're expecting 1,000 children for this okay. trunk or treat night on Halloween night, October 31st. Also remember that... Um, we are going to be in front of Pearl City Hall and the library right next to City Hall on Saturday, October 31st. The event starts at 5 and goes to 7, but we're going to meet there at 3 o'clock to set up. We will talk more about uh, volunteers and um, shifts or, you know, as far as setting up or taking down, anything like that to help. We'll talk more about that on Friday when we see you all there at 530. Nice. Love you guys. Now yeah. over to you, Pastor. All right. I can't see you this evening, but it's good to see you. That's what we usually say. Um, it's been a good day. And uh, just a couple of announcements now that Sister Brenda and Andrew have told y'all a few things. We have got our gates up at church. Uh, they're already uh, locked. And uh, we hope that this uh, remedies the problem of having a lot of work trucks that people around town are bringing in, 18 wheelers that are turning around in our parking lot, uh, people coming in, throwing stuff out that don't need to be there, just all kind of things we're trying to remedy. If this don't do it, we can go a little bit further and we can take measures if we have to and put up a fence across the front on the other side over there. So, But anyway, we hope that this does it. We're getting things ready uh, and trusting the Lord that within the next six months, we're going to have all our money for this parking lot. So y'all keep uh, keep praying about that, that God will continue to bless us. He's been so good this year, and uh, our church has seen so many blessings, but we know that God in this new year to come, he's going to be doing good things too. Uh, also, Brother Jeff Davis has sent in a prayer request. Uh, he said that um, uh, 
he uh, that his children are in the path of this storm that is coming in. So we need to lift them up in prayer and ask God to put a hedge of protection uh, around them. And also uh, at the end of Sunday service, and you know, uh, over the last few weeks, I've had somebody that asked me about communion. Well, I've been planning on doing communion, and we're going to do that at the end of this Sunday service. Let, let, let me say something here. Um, communion is for people who are in right standing with God. Uh, it's not something to be taken lightly. It, it says uh, the Bible talks about as often as we do it, we do it in remembrance of Jesus and we want to make sure that we don't take this lightly because the Bible said if you eat and drink unworthily, you eat and drink damnation to your soul. And, uh, uh, you know, I, well, I'm just going to say it. You can't be cussing Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday or all throughout the week and then come to church and take communion on Sunday. So let's let's pray about this. This is a serious uh, service. I say it'll be geared a little bit different this Sunday morning. And it's a blessing if you're serving the Lord, but if you're not serving the Lord, there's nothing wrong with coming to church and join the, the worship and the service. Don't feel obligated to take communion if everything is not right with you and the Lord. So there, with that out of the way, uh, you know, let's be praying about that this week. And if there's anything you can think of in your life, you say, God, I want you to remove that because the Bible said he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, and then we're worthy to take that communion. Amen. Amen. Well, tonight, uh, the the message is, uh, the lesson is on the Messiah comes. Now, we all know in a, about uh, six to seven weeks, we're going to be gearing up talking about it, and I can guarantee you a lot of our lessons are going to be geared toward uh, Christmas themes and things that happen uh, along that line. But but tonight, uh, it's still is talking about the Messiah. And Christmas is not the only time we need to realize that we have one. Amen. Jesus paid a dear price for us. It says, God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to save us from, uh, from our sin. And John 3, 16, which is one of the most moving scriptures in the Bible, um, that it says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. And when the message says the Messiah comes and he comes to save us from our sins, John three seventeen goes along with that. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He wants you to realize your need for him as Savior in your life. So um, it says that he came to save us from our sins. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Why did it emphasize, why did it use the word the? He's the only way. There is no other way. There is no other God. There's only one God, and he has one son, and his name is Jesus Christ, and you have to go through Jesus to get to the Father. He's our advocate. He's our go-between. So let, let's look at the lesson uh, overview. But before we do, I just want to have a quick word of prayer and ask the Lord to, to touch our hearts and our minds tonight. Father, right now in the name of Jesus, Lord, we thank you that you loved us enough, Father, that you sent your son, Jesus, into the world so that you could bridge the gap uh, you could make a way where there wasn't any way, and we could be, once again have communion with you, fellowship with you through your son, Jesus Christ. Father, I ask that you would open the scriptures to our spirit tonight, open our hearts and our minds that we'd be receptive, and Lord, that it would change us, God. Lord, that we would take it to heart, not only at Christmas, which is coming up in the next few months, but all throughout the year. And Father, I, be I believe it, I pray it, that you're going to touch our people's heart with this word tonight in Jesus' name, Amen. Um, it uh, the lesson overview. It says this lesson provides a survey of the life of Jesus Christ. Now, uh, before I've told you, the name Jesus means Savior, and the name Christ 
means anointed one. So uh, Jesus was anointed. He was blessed by God to carry out this mission. We'll be talking about that a little more in Scripture here in a minute. But it says Jesus' birth and childhood uh, is the story of his God-given purpose to save his people. You know, God doesn't save us for nothing. Uh, he loves us, and he wants us to be in fellowship with him. But he saves us, and we're to be workers in his vineyard. There is a purpose and a reason uh, behind the Lord. He loves us. He saves us, but he wants us to be workers in the kingdom and to win souls for him. There, there, there's a work to be done today. And, and it says he wants to save his people. First Timothy chapter 1, verse 15 says, This is a faithful saying, worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Now, this is the Apostle Paul. This is the man that wrote the majority of the New Testament. He said he came to save sinners, and I'm one of the worst ones there's ever been. Paul recognized his need for a Messiah, for a Savior. He knew he couldn't do it by himself. And see, that's what we've got to come to today. We've got to realize that there's a purpose behind all of this, that God does love us, but he saves us and he calls us into the work of his kingdom. Uh, let's go back here. It says, uh, in his early understanding, Jesus, this is his early understanding of the Father's will. It is also the story of the commitment of Joseph and Mary to raise Jesus uh, with his calling ever before them. Can you imagine uh, being uh, Joseph and Mary? They were young, and for an angel to appear to her and tell her that she would have a child, and she even brought, brought that out. She said, I've never been with a man. This was a supernatural thing. And, you, you know, uh, I've been praying for the last few weeks. It's funny we mentioned that word supernatural. I have asked God, you know, we're in a day where people don't need to be playing games anymore with God. And I've been praying and saying, God, give our people at, at, at our local church, uh, bless them in a supernatural way, God, spiritually, physically, financially. And, and God, give them a supernatural hunger uh, and thirst to come to church and be in unity and fellowship with one another. We need that more. That the world, they stand together. Every evil thing they've got going on now, they gather together in mass numbers to accomplish what they want. And, you know, the children of God, we need to be in fellowship and unity. And you say, well, is that really, is that scriptural? Yes, it is. It says uh, a single strand can be easily broken, but a threefold cord cannot easily be broken. And another scripture said how good and pleasant it is for God's people to dwell together in unity. Another scripture, and, you know, there is a lot of people that could, could take this scripture to heart today uh, it says, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. When the house of the Lord is meeting as children of God, we need to be there unless we are sick in our body. There's no excuse for just missing church. And we've got so many today, you don't know if they're coming, if they're going to be there this Sunday, or they might skip this Sunday and hit next Sunday, or skip three Sundays and show up on the fourth. Uh, you know, you can't work a job like that. Your boss would fire you if you did that. But we feel like, well, I can come and go from church when I want to. You're not serving a church or a pastor. You're serving the Lord. And you need to be faithful. When you put your hand to the plow, you don't need to look back. Because the Bible said if we look back, we're not fit for the kingdom of God. Whatsoever you find to do with your hand, do it with all of your might. So if you're going to serve the Lord, serve the Lord. And you say, well, uh, I, I can read my Bible at home. You can't be in fellowship at home. If you need prayer, you can't call for the elders of the church and they anoint you at home. People say, well, I've got a television preacher. Call him and see if he'll come and anoint you with oil. That's not going to happen. We've got to have a local body where we meet together in unity and in fellowship. Now, let's move forward here. It says they understood uh, that he had a calling. Can, can you imagine how Joseph, how inadequate he probably felt? knowing that uh, when the angel revealed to him also in a dream, you know, this is, this is actually 
uh, going to be the son of God. You'll call his name Jesus. Can you imagine how inadequate Joseph felt? He probably thought, what could I ever teach uh, that Jesus, you know, coming up, if this is God's son, what could I do in, in the human, in the flesh? What can I do? And he felt probably a lot of times inadequate. I know as children of God, we feel that way sometimes. We feel very inadequate for what God called us to do. But if you'll walk in his strength and in his might and in his power, you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. So, so let, let, let's go back here. It says, for our study, it may be simple to celebrate uh, the ultimate life purpose of Jesus Christ to save the world. And from his mission statement in Luke chapter 4, 18 and through 19 and Isaiah 61, 1 and 2, uh, his mission to the broken was distinct. He, the scripture said he came to seek and save that which was lost. Have you ever noticed people sometimes they're, they're so bitter, they're so... Uh, withdrawn or reclusive or usually it's because they've been wounded they've been hurt they're lost they don't know the Lord like they need to they don't have a close enough relationship with him those are the people that Jesus came to save he came to set the captive free People say well I'm not captive nobody's got chains on me if you have bitterness hatred animosity jealousy in your life uh, a Jezebel spirit uh, that's dominating you uh, you are a captive and the Lord came to set the captive free that's the good news it said he came to the broken and he and, and empowered them by the Holy Spirit we need to pray every day now Lord I, I'm in the flesh uh, I'm living and breathing but your scripture said be in the world but not of the world how can I do that well we know what the flesh desires it desires the ways of the world so we have got to feed our spirit, man. How do we do that? We feed through the power of the Holy Spirit. We study the word. He reveals it to us. And as we pray, the Holy Spirit will move on us. And, and, and even sometimes when we're so lost or things are so bad, we're so hurt or wounded, we can pray in the Holy Spirit. And it says that he will intercede for us. He'll make groanings we don't even understand. He knows how to pray and intercede for us when we can't pray for ourselves. And that's why you need to be around other Christians. When you get weak, we call for people to come around us, and, and those people can lay hands on us and pray for us. If we're sick in body, you call for the elders of the church. They'll anoint you with oil, and the prayer of faith will heal the sick. Amen? So the, the, this is why we believe the way we do. And it says, finally, there are countless ways to consider the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Uh, the lesson outline, Jesus' birth uh, and childhood. And it starts in Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 through 24. And another one's Luke chapter 2, 41 through 52. It's got two parts to this, uh, the first part here. Uh, this, this section one, Jesus' birth and childhood. It's got an A and a B section. Jesus came to save people. And, and, and if you look back the scripture, the angel told Mary, it says in verse 21, Jesus will save his people from their sins. We knew from the very beginning what his destiny was, what God had sent him for. And uh, the second part, part B, said Jesus came to do the will of the Father and a little later, we'll read the scripture. But you know that this started as early as 12 years old. The Holy Spirit was moving on him. And I believe at that point, Jesus knew his destiny. He was confounding uh, the wisest men of the age at 12 years old. And um, it, it, his parents had missed him. And they had left the city. They were on their way back home. And after a few days, they thought he was in the caravan somewhere with some of the family. And as they searched, nobody had seen Jesus. They went back and they found him in the temple and he was teaching and talking to these people. Uh, and, and the people were astounded at his wisdom. And when they said, why have you done this? Jesus said, uh, why do you seek me like this? Do you not know that I must be about my father's business? So at 12 years old, he already had a revelation of who he was and what he was called to do. And you know, if, if you're drifting through this life, 
and you don't know what God has called you to do, you need to pray until the Holy Spirit reveals to you what God has called you, what destiny he's called you to, because he, he didn't save you for nothing. He's got a purpose. Jeremiah 29, 11, the Lord says, I know the thoughts that I think concerning you. And he goes into all this detail. You know, I have, I have a good will and a good future and a good purpose for you. That means he's got some specific for you to do. And if you don't know what that is, you need to pray until the Holy Spirit reveals it, and then you can do that. Amen. Uh, it says, Jesus' earthly ministry, uh, the mission of Jesus Christ. What was that mission? To teach, to preach, to heal, and to set free. And he, there he was right under uh, uh, all of the Jewish leaders' noses. He was laying hands on people and the sick were recovering. He was telling crippled people to rise up and walk at a later point in his life. They would raise up and take the bed, their mat that they were laying on. They should have known who he was because only God can do these things. And it says, um, let's look at this next part here. Uh, Jesus' power to forgive sins. If you'll remember the story of the paralytic, his friends were desperate to get their friend help. They led him down through the roof. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said, I've not seen this kind of faith in all of Israel. And immediately uh, he, he told him, he said, you know, uh, you know, your sins are forgiven you and rise and take that. said, who is this that even forgives sins? He said, what would it be easier for me to say? Rise, take up your bed. Why? He said, so you know that the Son of God has power on earth to forgive sins. I also say to you, rise, take up your bed and walk. If he could heal a cripple, he also could forgive his sins because he had to be the Messiah. Amen? So uh, the third part says Jesus' death and resurrection. And it talks about uh, uh, the details of the crucifixion. We know that it was a gruesome thing. He, uh, he was mocked. He was ridiculed. Uh, he was carried before. Uh, it was a false trial. They got it together uh, at night. Nothing good is done uh, late, late at night. I've had parents say, well, I don't know where in the world we went wrong with it. If little Johnny is 16 years old and he's riding around with his friends smoking dope at 2 o'clock in the morning, nothing good. Parents, here's a clue for you. Nothing good happens after midnight. From midnight till, till 6, 7 o'clock next morning, your kids need to be in the house with you if they're underage. So, uh, you know, some things it just takes common sense for us. But it, it talks about uh, how Jesus, he had went through this trial, and it was late at night, and they brought all these false accusations. They paid people to make, boy, wouldn't you hate to go to the judgment knowing you was one of those that bore false witness against the Son of God, and they're going to point, they're going to go, oh, we remember that guy. That's going to be an awful and dreadful day for some people. But for a child of God, we don't have to fear uh, Judgment Day. We don't have to fear if, when the rapture takes place. It's going to be a blessed event for us. And, and, and the crucifixion uh, accomplished this. The Bible says without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. For us to be forgiven and our sins being covered by the blood, there had to be a sacrifice. And I'm so glad the, the word says, uh, he said, nobody takes my life from me. J Jesus could have stopped this at any point. Oh, but I'm so glad that he didn't. He said, but I willingly lay my life down and I willingly take it up again. And that's exactly what he did. The next part of this is, is not, not just the crucifixion, not just the burial. And he was buried in a barred tomb. And, and you know, people say, that's sad. He didn't even have his, he wasn't going to need it, but just a couple of days anyway. Amen. He's the son of God. But that last part is the part that I really like. He was resurrected. And, and you know, he, the word said he became the first fruits of the resurrection because he rose from the dead. You have this hope today that you too will rise one day. We know what the scriptures say. And, and one of these days, the dead in Christ, the trumpet of God will sound and the dead in Christ will rise and then those of us that remain will be called up to meet them in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. He's ascended, and when he comes back for us, we're going up too. Amen, church. So I'm excited about that resurrection part. Uh, the, the golden text said, Behold, the virgin shall be with child, 
And, and, and you know, a lot of people, they just read this scripture and they kind of move on quickly. But the reason that it was so important for Mary to be a virgin, eh, but, but because if she had, if she had, if Joseph had actually been the father of Jesus, Jesus could not have lived without sin. Why? Because when, the, when a man has a child with a woman, the seed of sin, the Adamic nature, is in that child when he's born. But the scripture said about Jesus, he who knew no sin became sin. It's true, Mary was the mother, but God himself was the father. And she was overshadowed by the power of the Holy Spirit and she conceived and, and brought forth her firstborn son. You know, it's a wonderful thought that Jesus was willing to leave the portals of glory and to come down in this sin-ridden world. And he did it all because he loves you and because he loves me. Amen. What, what is this lesson? What are the goals of this lesson? Uh, the first one is to impart and reinforce knowledge, seeing that Jesus' life story is so well-known and well-loved by so many, it's to inform us and to remind us of the biblical facts about his life. You want to find Jesus? He, he's in there. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. And in the beginning, in the creation, God said, uh, Come now, let us make man in our image. So we know that the Son has been there all along, uh, if you really want to dig deep. But if you're, if you're a new Christian and you just really want to know about the life of Jesus, look in the four Gospels. That's where you're going to find him. And, and, and if you will read all four, uh, people say, well, where would you start reading the Bible? Well, if you need uplifting and you've been in a state of depression, read the Psalms. Um, if you need wisdom, read Proverbs. But you know, if you really want to know about Jesus, read each one of the four Gospels in its entirety, then you can piece the whole picture together and you truly understand who Jesus is. Amen. And it's to influence our attitude to encourage us to receive the things that Jesus wants us to, us to receive prayerfully and in an attitude of worship. He said, I don't feel the Spirit of the Lord like I want to. Did you come in worshiping? God inhabits the praises of his people. When you worship, the Spirit of the Lord comes down. So we have to host that Spirit if we want him to come and, and be in the midst of us and to feel that Spirit. It's, and the third part is to influence behavior. For us to know and be able to tell the major facts about Jesus' life as a way of making the gospel known to those who do not know it. And this is our great commission. Go ye therefore. We are to tell people, people say, well, I only want to hang out with Christians. Well, you can't win anybody. If you only hang out with people who are already saved, you can't win anybody. We have got to be the hands and the feet of Christ extended. We've got to be his hand reached out to them today. We have got to be the light of the world. We've got to put our feet into motion. We've got to be out there sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's what the great commission for the people of God in the church is today. The historical literary background. Now let's, let's look at this for a minute. In the New Testament, the four gospels are all about the birth, life, ministry, death, and resurrection, and the ascension of Jesus Christ. And if you remember what he said when he ascended, he said, uh, the angel asked him, you men of Galilee, why do you stand here gazing? This same Jesus that you see going up, he's coming back in like manner. And one of these days, he's coming back for us. That's his promise. He said, I'm going away to prepare a mansion for you. If it were not so, I would have told you, uh, in my father's house are many mansions. And then he said, and if I go away, I will come again and receive you unto myself. And I don't believe that we're far away from that, the way the world's been going. I believe that we are soon to see the return of Jesus Christ. I'm excited about that. That's what puts the fire in my batteries every Sunday so we can have service. I'm looking forward to that day when he returns and takes us home and gets, we're not home here. You're in the world and not of the world, and you're not to be in love with it. It says, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world, because if you love the world, the love of the Father is not in you. So there's nothing here. If he gets ready to come back and take me home, there's nothing here that's going to be holding my heart. I'm not going to be like when Lot and his wife were leaving Sodom and she looked back. Why? Because in her heart, 
Her heart was still in the city, but if her heart had been focused on God, that's where we need to be, focused on God and what he did, what he accomplished by, by dying for us on the cross and, and the fact that Jesus is coming back for us. He's coming back for a bride without spot and without wrinkle. When you look in that mirror, that spiritual mirror, do you have spots? Do you have wrinkles? You know, all of us, the Bible says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We do fall short, but you know what? We're to strive. We say, God, I see some things in me. If it, Like King David says, search me, Lord. Search the inner part of my heart. If there's anything in me, purge me with hyssop. If you got to take me to spiritual woodshed, whip me, Jesus. He said, I want to be right before you. He said, purge me, clean me. David didn't want anything between him and God. We know David fell short, but David knew how to repent, and that's what we've got to do today. We've got to repent. We can't hold hatred, bitterness, animosity, jealousy, all these things. It's a form of witchcraft. It's not of God, and it's not going to make it into the kingdom of heaven. So if you've got any of those things, lay it aside. The Bible said, lay aside those weights that so easily beset us. We don't want some little bitty something to keep us out of the kingdom of heaven. Amen? Amen. But it says, if you look back at these four gospels, it tells you all about the life, ministry, death, resurrection, the ascension of Jesus. And it says, uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke were likely written A.D. 64 to 68, while it's believed that John was written later, possibly after A.D. Uh, 90. This lesson is based on three of the four gospels, Matthew, Luke, and John, while Mark was likely the first that was written. Virtually all of Mark is incorporated into Matthew, so most of what you'll find in Mark, you're also going to see it uh, in Matthew. Some of these things get repetitive throughout the gospels. But you know, my wife tells me she's a school teacher. And people say, you know, the preachers, they say this over and over and over. Why do y'all preach on adultery? Why do you preach on all these vices that we have and uh, all these addictions and things? As soon as you stop doing them, we'll stop preaching on them and move to something else that you've got going on. Amen? That's our job. We're to look at you, and the Bible says we're to reprove, uh, rebuke, and exhort. That means we teach you. And then we rebuke what you've got that's, that's going on in your life that is not of God. Then we exhort you and tell you there is a better way, and that way is Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's, let's go to the scriptures now. Uh, Matthew 1 and 21 said, And she will bring forth a son, and you'll call his name Jesus, meaning Savior, and he will save his people from their sins. Uh, Luke 2 and 49 said, And he said to them, Why do you seek me? This is when his parents had missed him. We was talking about it a while ago. He says, uh, did you not know that I must be about my father's business? Uh, he was letting them know, I'm only fulfilling the destiny. Remember that angel mom, dad, that, that came to you and revealed who I was and, and what I would do? I'm only fulfilling the destiny that God has set before me. And that destiny is bringing the message of salvation. Here's a question for you tonight. What is your destiny? And if you realize what it is, are you fulfilling that destiny? And if you're not, we need to be in prayer. God help us to fulfill the things that you've called us to do in our life. Amen. And it says, Then he went down with them, and he came to Nazareth, and he was subject to them. Now, th now think about this. At the age of 12, he's, his parents come and says, What are you doing? Why are you missing? You know, And, and we know... Uh, that, that up till about the age of uh, 30, you didn't see or hear very much about Jesus. Now, this is 18 years uh, in, in Scripture that you don't really see very much or hear much of Jesus. So what was going on at that time? He had made himself subject to his parents. He lived a normal life. He was a carpenter. No doubt he worked with his father. And, and he, was, uh, he was in the middle of a family. He had brothers, the Bible says. And Jesus... The Bible talks about, he says, we don't have a high priest who cannot be touched by the feelings of our infirmities, but in all manner as we are tempted, he was tempted yet without sin. 
Don't you know he had some brothers that got in his face and aggravated him, and he probably felt his temper begin to well up. You say, oh, I would. I'd. It said he was tempted just like we are in every manner, yet without sin. He kept that flesh under subjection, and that's what we've got to do today. Keep that flesh under subjection, and he was subject to his parents, and he kept all these things. His mother kept all these things in her heart. She knew what was going on with him. You know, today... People don't like to be subject to somebody else. Uh, they don't like to be under authority. And uh, you, you have a lot of guys, they'll say, well, I, I want to be a leader in my church, or I feel called to preach, or, uh, you know, if you can't be a servant. I didn't start, I started out, I, I would help uh, be a chauffeur. I wasn't even a youth pastor. I was chauffeuring for a friend of mine that was youth pastor. I would take a van, and I would follow him around. He'd drive a big bus, and I'd... I'd drive a little van. But you know what? It was important. Anything you do in the kingdom of God is important. First, God's going to give you something little. He's going to see if he can trust you with it. And if you're faithful in a few things, he'll make you rule over many. And, you know, then the next thing, I worked in youth camps. Uh, I, there were times that I cooked. There was times that I washed dishes. And I'm going to tell you, if you, uh, I, li I like the automatic dishwashers they have now because in the youth camp where I used to go, we were in the Church of God of Prophecy at that time, and, and I made the mistake one year tell them, I can wash any, I don't care how much you throw with me, I can handle whatever. Well, I'm going to tell you something. The end of the second day, I never wanted to see another dish in my life. I've cleaned toilets in churches. Uh, I, I've helped pick up trash all around the church grounds. Uh, I've helped dig up busted water lines. See, if you can't do the small things, you can't do the big things. The problem is nobody wants to do the small things anymore. Nobody wants to do the grunt work. Well, you know, David, King David didn't start out uh, as the king of Israel. He started out as a shepherd boy. He was out there tending the sheep, and he smelled like them. He slept outside with them. So you don't despise the day. The Bible says don't despise the day of small things because everything starts small. A plant that will grow up and, and you can pick five gallons of tomatoes off of that bush, it didn't start out as a giant plant. It started out as a small sprout that burst forth from the dust. It, everything has its small beginnings, but then God will use you. He'll mature you. He'll grow you, and then finally you can bear fruit. And, and see, that, that's what we need to do. We need to take time, become rooted, grounded, and established then God can use us and we can bear fruit. But it says, um, it says in verse 52, Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. Everywhere he went, I believe he had a smile, and the Bible says everywhere he went, he went about doing good. You know, you know that's a way for a, a child of God. People say, well, what can I do? I, they're excited when they first get saved. Just love the Lord and let people see the light of Christ in you. And everywhere you go, do good. They're going to notice something in you. They're drawn to it. They don't even realize what it is. It's the favor of God. It's the spirit of the Lord living on the inside of you that they're drawn. They're drawn just like a moth to a flame. That's the reason the Bible says you're the light of the world. You'll draw people when you're a light. Amen. Let, let's go back here. It says, Jesus said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me. And, and you know, I looked up that word. It means uh, the, uh, uh, to anoint someone for something means to choose uh, as the best candidate for a position. No other man that has ever walked or lived or breathed ever fulfilled even a tenth of the prophecies of the Messiah like Jesus. He fulfilled every one of them. He was the perfect candidate. And do you know the Bible says that Jesus went as a lamb before the dumb shears. And it said he opened not his mouth. They were beating him, spitting on him, plucking the beard out of his face. Don't you know it took great love and compassion. And when he was dying, he even prayed for those that had persecuted him and crucified him. Today, somebody can just halfway say some little something and if we don't like the tone they said it in or what, we don't agree with them, we want to snap like a bulldog and bite their head. That's not of God. That's not the way the Lord operates. And that's not the spirit he wants us to walk in. Let, let's go back here. It says, 
uh, he says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. Isn't it wonderful to know Jesus was a preacher? He just went about sharing the word. I, I like that. It says, he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. You say, well, I've been going to church for years and I've got some things he hasn't set me free from yet. You have got to accept it. He's not going to force it. The Spirit of the Lord is a gentleman. He wants to help you. He wants to set you free. But you've got to be willing to receive his Spirit before he can help you with these things. Amen. Verse 19 says, To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And he began to say to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. He might as well shout it to the top of his lungs. I'm the Messiah. You've been looking for him. I'm right here under your nose. And boy, it shook some people's apple cart up when he said this. Amen. When, when you preach under the anointing, when you witness under the anointing of the Lord, when you love people in a supernatural way, even when they're very not, not very kind or loving to you, you still love them. That doesn't mean that, that, that we approve of the sin in their life. And, and you know, that's the reason the word says that you also rebuke those things. You tell them what's wrong, but you do it in such a way you say, I, you know, the Lord loves you. You need to live in a better fashion. It's you've got to make heaven your home one day. That's going to draw people when you approach them that way. Amen. So it says, Jesus said, which is easier to say? Uh, your sins are forgiven you or to say, rise and walk. Uh, you, if, if you want interpretation of that, Jesus said, you, you can split hairs over it. You, you can, whatever you, you can split it right out of the middle. I can either tell the fellow, rise, take up your bed and walk, or your sins are forgiven because I can do one or the other. I can do both of them because I am the Messiah. Amen. So he, I mean, he was steady letting them know in his actions. He was letting them know exactly who he was. And today people know exactly who you are, not by what you're saying, but by your actions. And uh, he says, but that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. You know that he had to be from God because only the Lord can forgive your sins. Amen. As he said, he said to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. And immediately he rose up before them, took up what he had been laying on, and departed to his own house house glorifying God. See, now, now this man, he immediately began to praise God. How many times, if we'd be honest and confess it, we have prayed for God, Lord, I need you to move. I need some miracles in my life. And then it happens, and we don't even recognize it was God that done it. We don't give him the praise. And then maybe a month down the road, something in your spirit thumps your heart. The Holy Spirit moves on you and says, you didn't even say thank you. You say, well, I don't know that that's important to the Lord. Well, he healed 10 lepers. Only one came back, and you know what he said? I healed 10 of you. Only you alone came back to give thanks. Where's the other nine? So God does recognize when he does a miracle in our life, he knows whether we're thankful for it or not. We need to give him the credit when he does something good in our life. Uh, John 19 and 17 says, and he, bearing his cross, went to a place called the place of a skull, which in the Hebrew is called Golgotha. It was just outside the gates. And the scripture said he suffered outside of the gates. They took him up on uh, Golgotha. They raised that cross up. And remember what scripture said? And if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men to me. You say, I'd like to see some people saved in our church. I'd like to see the Spirit moved in our church. When we stop lifting up self and we start lifting up Jesus, he said, and if I be lifted up, I will draw all men to me. He didn't say that you could, you could do it in yourself, that you could take the glory for it. We've got to raise him up. We've got to lift him up, magnify his name, and then he will draw people. I've had people say, I want you to tell me, preacher, am I going to heaven or hell? Uh, I want you to tell me what's, I want your opinion. God don't need my opinion. He don't need your opinion. And I'm not your judge. My job is to preach the gospel. It's exactly what it says. 
I believe every word is divinely inspired, and if God said it, I'm not going to try to change it for you, me, or anybody else. It is what it is. And when you die and draw that last breath, the Bible says, the tree, when it falls, so shall it lay. You can't change it after they draw that last breath. Whatever it is is what it is. Amen? Let's go back here. And it says, when they crucified him and two others with him, one on one side and one on the other, and Jesus was in the center. Now, do you know there's two men? They are both within probably close to the same distance, one on his left and one on his right hand. Both men close to him. Both men being crucified just like him. But you know there was a difference in these two men. What was the difference? They, they were even both thieves. They both had committed crimes. So what separated them? What made them different? One man reviled. One man was bitter. One man would not repent, but the other looked at the Lord and with a broken heart and, and a contrite spirit. He says, Lord, remember me this day when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said, this day thou shalt be with me in paradise. Now that's the miracle of it right there. This thief that repented right there, Lord, remember me. This is the one that was justified, not the other that wouldn't repent. And, and he was the first recipient of what Jesus was accomplishing on the cross. Even before he drew that last breath, that thief was repenting and Jesus was forgiving him right there and he was also speaking forgiveness over the very men that crucified him. We have got to learn to forgive each other. The Bible says if you don't forgive your brother of his trespasses, neither will your heavenly Father forgive you of your trespasses. Your salvation is contingent upon your forgiveness towards your brother that has wronged you. Oh, I know that's powerful. I know that's hard to chew up sometimes. But that is the kind of God that we serve. That's what he requires of us. And, and it says, Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb while it was still dark. It was early in the morning, and she saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. Why was that stone rolled away? It was not, contrary to popular belief, it was not to let Jesus out of that tomb because later he went to the disciples. The door was shut securely and he walked right through that door. God don't need a man to open up a door or roll a stone away from him. That stone was not rolled away so Jesus could get out. That stone was rolled away as a testimony of men. He is the risen Savior. He's the Messiah of the world. Amen. And it says, while it was still dark and she saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. And Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples the things that she had seen and that she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things to her. Then the same day at evening being the first day of the week. Now here's this scripture I was telling you about. This is verse 19. When the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, they were closed up. They were in fear of their life. Do you know this year we've gone through We've had a lot of churches throughout the early part of this year. They were in fear to open their doors. They were in fear to even have it service in the parking lot because the police and the government and different people were acting nutty as a fruitcake, and, and you had people running up in department stores and doing and buying whatever they wanted, going to casinos and everywhere else. Oh, but we would get $500 fines in Greenville, Mississippi, they did, for sitting in their car with the windows rolled up listening to the gospel of Jesus Christ as some preacher preached in the parking lot. You don't believe that we're in a day where they're persecuting the church? You need to wake up, church. You need to sound the alarm in Zion. We need to be celebrating who Jesus is, and we need to put our trust and our faith in him today. But it says the doors were shut up. They were fearful. They were in the middle of a, a, a situation they didn't understand. They were desperate. The only hope that they had that they had was in Jesus, and they had all seen him viciously murdered, put to death. And do you know some of them, they thought all hope is lost. With Jesus, hope is never lost. With men, these things seem impossible, but with God, all things are possible. It doesn't make any difference what your situation is. He can walk right into the middle of your situation, and he can speak life to you, and that's what he did 
to these disciples there that day. And it said, Jesus came and stood in their midst. And what did he say to them? Peace be to you. And that's what he's still speaking to us today. There's so much more in this lesson than I could go in tonight. But here's the main part that we need to know because it gets repetitious as you go through the four Gospels and different little things are told. But the main thing is to know that God so loved you that he sent his son into the world. He was born in the most humble of situations. They were poor. They didn't have any money. And the Bible even says in one place, uh, there wasn't anything about his appearance that when you looked on him that you would desire him. It, it wasn't that G Jesus was GQ and looked like some Romeo. He looked like the average normal man. He didn't have uh, he didn't have a leg up on anybody. And do you know what he did? He had hard conditions, hard times too. But he served God in the good time and in the bad. And if you look back, what he said, I must be about my father's business. As we approach the holiday season, we know we all know what we associate Thanksgiving with. You ask the kids, they say that's turkey, ham, and dressing, and and and, and giblet gravy, and that's all good too. But Thanksgiving to me is about being thankful. And you know what Christmas is about to me? It ain't about some fat guy in a suit. It's about celebrating the birthday of Jesus Christ and celebrating how much he loved us. And that if we had been the only one in the world that was lost and there was no other way, he would have came for just you and he would have came for just me. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, God, we thank you, Lord, for what you accomplished. We thank you because there was no way that you made a way. We thank you that you were willing. You And in the flesh, Jesus, we know that there was a struggle that was going on. You said, Father, if it's your will, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Lord, help us, Jesus, to put our will aside and to put your will first. And, Lord, that we would do the things that you have set us here to do. This is an exciting time. This I know that we're in the end of days. This is an exciting time when we can let our light so shine before the world. We can point the way to you. I pray that you're doing that tonight, church. We love you. Be blessed. In Jesus' name, amen.